Before we get started, we'd like to thank Allianz Trade for sponsoring this episode of Let's Get Charity. Allianz Trade is the trademark used to designate a range of services provided by Euler Hermes. Euler Hermes is the global leader in trade credit insurance and a recognized specialist in the areas of surety, collections, structured trade credit, and political risk. For more information on Allianz Trade Surety, visit their website referenced in the description. Now, on to our show. You're listening to Let's Get Surety. Let me hear your bonding talk with Kat Shamapande. Hey everyone, it's Kat Shamapande. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Let's Get Surety. I have my co-host today with me, Mark McCallum, CEO of NESVP. Hey Mark, thanks for being on. Hi Kat, it's great to be back. Another great topic coming up. I know, I'm very excited about this. On our past episodes, if you've had a chance to listen, we've spent time discussing technology from e-signature to e-bonding and the new efficiencies and changes that they've brought to the surety space. Today, we're going to be taking a look at surety claims and discussing technology and data and how they're reshaping that space as well. So to do that, we have with us today, Jim Milos, Assistant Vice President and Head of Surety and Fidelity Claims at Nationwide. Hey, Jim, thanks for being on. Good morning. Thank you for having me. We are thrilled to have you here. So, Jim, before we dive into this topic, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and about Nationwide? Certainly. Uh, And again, thank you for the opportunity. So um, my undergrad is in finance, um, so I'm not a technology person by training. Uh, In law school, I, I learned about suretyship as a sentence in a contract law book. (laughs) <laughs> uh, that we believe right past uh, and knew very little of it until uh, I was studying in London and got a call from my sister that uh, there were two great surety professionals who were leaving their respective firms to come together. And uh, that was T. Scott Leo and uh, Michael Weber and starting their own firm. Uh, she told me immediately, they're brilliant people. You'll learn a ton get a clerkship there as soon as you can. And uh, I had an interview with them from a pub in London where I was studying at the time. <laughs> and it uh, it turned out very well. And I learned uh, a ton from one of the best uh, surety bankruptcy uh, practitioners and uh, commercial and contract surety attorneys out there. So it was really a great opportunity. And uh, I had spent the bulk of my career at uh, CNA Surety uh, where I had the opportunity to work in um, handling claims, contract, uh, larger accounts for the bulk of my career, managing a great staff and a collection team. Um, I had a wonderful time there and then uh, saw a great opportunity at Nationwide uh, to continue to grow and build and uh, had moved there just recently. So it's been a real great opportunity and everybody's been absolutely fantastic in the transition. So I've had that benefit of being at, in two great organizations uh, in the last nearly 22 years in my surety career. So it's been fantastic. That's awesome. So I think to start talking about this topic, we probably want to start with what surety claims departments looked like when you started. Certainly. So, uh, you know, um, uh, I unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, one of those non, <laughs> you know, uh, technological natives. I didn't grow up with an iPad or an iPod. Um, they didn't exist when we started in this. And uh, for, you know, cutting edge technology uh, at the time, it was Word Perfect or Microsoft Word. We were using Word, which was great. Um, but for the most part, the way that we were <laughs> handling claims at the time was you had a, a Redwell file folder full of a whole bunch of paper claims and manila folders. And then everything in there was hopefully uh, chronologically. And so (laughs) you knew how bad a file was by how much of a desk it took or how many other desks it took as you were handling it. Um, There was no find replace in that folder. (laughs) Oh yeah. No, well there was, there, there was a lot of replace. Did anything get in there? You know, one of the biggest problems you have was, was, seeing if any of the conversations you had that you actually put into notes ended up in a file. Um, let's not get the auditor started on problems with that. But, so, <laughs> uh, you know, moving past that, when we started, it was, you know, the it was a Microsoft letter that was a general template acknowledging a claim. And 
Um, the more sophisticated people would use find and replace. The the less sophisticated would read the actual letter, even though they've read it a thousand times, and they'd go and find name A, and they'd highlight it, they'd delete it, and they'd replace it with name B, and they'd do that with each letter that they wrote. And uh, the time that it takes to do that is really problematic, um, especially when you're writing generally the same letter and, and the number of claims you're experiencing, you know, anywhere in the hundreds to thousands organizationally that you'd have a year. And, uh, you know, when we looked at that originally, um, I saw just a, a nice little opportunity for us to use um, with a finance background, I knew how to use Excel and we just used Excel and a Microsoft Word document to make that general letter into a template. And then you put your information into a spreadsheet, you're able to track what's happening as opposed to having to run to a file room that may or, not, may or, may or may not be nearby and uh, run that file back to find out what a status is when you get a phone call from a claimant. Um, so it gave us the opportunity to kind of do more things with that. In using that spreadsheet, I just started it as a lark to see what would happen and, and it really made me more effective. And uh, a little uh, sideline of that was, um, so I made it available to uh, everyone in my group at the time and a phenomenal surety attorney named Joan Clements um, you know, came over one day and said, you know, I never see, you're never stressed. You're never running around here getting files. What, why am I so busy and you're not busy at all? And I said, Joan, I'm, I'm handling as much, if not more. Um, I'm handling these letters. I'm handling Texas on or before the 15th day uh, of the second or third month, depending on the level of that claimant. And uh, this is how I do it. And she said, you're going to show me that. I said, absolutely. And she was brilliant and, and a phenomenal writer. Even when she spoke, uh, she would be able uh, off the top of her head to write things that you wish you could just record and put them straight in with a dictaphone um, because they were <laughs> that good. And so she said, show me how to use this. I give a tour. We start working on it. And the first week, um, she sat right across from me and, and she would complain to me almost the entire first week. In the second week, I heard about 50%, give or take. The third week, 25%. In the fourth week, it's strangely quiet. I'm concerned. Is she in the office? <laughs> um, what's happening? And the fifth week, she comes over and just says, that is a great little tool. Um, that's really amazing and really helpful. How about, um, you know, can you do more than just this initial letter? And I said, sure. If you have the letter, I can build it into a template pretty easily. And it was just a perfect marriage. And we ended up building you know, over the years that we worked together and subsequently probably over 800 letters uh, that we use not, and you're not building a, a, you know, a form letter that says, give me a thousand things when you only need the six they didn't already provide, <laughs> but um, right. you're able to take that uh, template and, and make it specific for what it is that you're doing. And, and we were able to build that out and it was really fantastic. Um, well, Jim, then, it sounds like you were an innovator. I was glad. I was a little worried that you were going to start with typewriters, but you jumped all the way up <laughs> to word processing. You know, they still use some typewriters for fill out bond forms. We're hoping to get away from that, right? Uh, um, absolutely. But but that's really exciting. That so you created a forms library with uh, you know word templates, right? And then uh, then trained apparently your colleagues uh, in in that, and then move that forward. It sounds like. Well, what happened was we ended up using this little system and we saw the benefits of it. You were able to see claimants, you were able to see um, how many claim files you actually had without having to look in a file room to find out how many there were. Um, and you were able to kind of see some information from that. And uh, my boss at the time looked at me and said, hey, you know, do you think we could build a, a a surety system, a claim system that would allow us to generate these letters uniformly for everyone? Um, and allow us to be able to uh, get more information from it. And, uh, um, you know, excitingly or stupidly, I, I said, sure, absolutely. And uh, we probably spent three or four years working uh, with IT closely. We had a, a team of people internally um, and IT resources, and we built a front-end system that was specific to surety. Um, a lot of the systems that we see in, in the surety world are defined insurance systems that we then try to bootstrap surety into. Um, you know, right. if you call it this, if you use this, use this naming structure to change that into this, and, and then we'll make it work. Um, here we were able to build a surety system, um, and it was really uh, phenomenal at the time. We, we put in 
automated emails. We put in um, other metrics and measurables that would allow us to say, hey, I have 100 claim files, but each one of those has seven claimants, five claimants, 10. That's a total of 300 notices. That more granular level gave you the ability to manage that information better and manage staff better. Because if you have 100 claim files and I have 100 claim files, prior to the systems and the information, we were essentially counted equally, except that I have Texas, which has seven claim files, 10 claim files. You have a bond type that gives you one claim file or one notice per claim file. Um, so now I, I have seven times the work that you do, except that on paper, we're doing the same. So why am I burning myself out and, and you're managing your workload effectively? So you had to be able to have that information to better manage the people who are doing the work um, right. to make sure you're not missing anything. Now, was this on the contract surety side or commercial or both? We designed it for the in entire operation. Uh, at the time, we okay. were running it in two. Uh, we had a Chicago office and a Sioux Falls office handling uh, contract and commercial, large and small. And so we wanted to design one system that would allow us to keep the data consistent between the two and uh, be able to compare apples to apples, what it was that we were seeing and what it was that we were doing. Um, and so in doing that, uh, you know, I was also handling claim files at the time too. So you're able to really build a system that helps you do what it is that we need to do. And the more important benefit was after building that system, we continue to refine it. And as technology improves, um, you know, that is where the future is going to be. How can we more effectively and efficiently handle claim files using the technology that we have? Um, you know, in and you've seen it on the, the prior podcasts where they talk about how can we make getting the bonds to the bondholders more efficient, more effective? How can we use credit scoring? Can we use risk analysis? We have all of these tools now that, that we can build into our systems and, and we can make that process as smooth and streamlined as possible. And that's where the future will be because there's no differentiator. Obviously, with surety companies, there are differentiators, but there's no real differentiator except for the process it takes. And if it's harder for the agent to do the business with the surety company, any surety company, it's going to be more likely that that agent is going to take that business somewhere else where it's easier and, and more smooth to do, do business with. And so what we were doing was essentially trying to do that exact same thing for the claim side of the business. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, surety in its simplest form is underwriting dollars in, claims dollars out. And if you can manage one of those effectively, you should be able to manage the other just as effectively. And, and if you do them both optimally, um, you can continue to be more and more profitable and more and more efficient and effective in what you're doing, not just in the dollars and cents, but in managing the customer expectation, getting them responses timely. Uh, helping them to understand what the issue is um, or what documentation they need to prove the item they have. You know, uh, the largest part of surety for all of us is explaining the difference between this and insurance. I have a claim, <laughs> where's my payment? You know, yeah. and, and under explaining that tripartite relationship, you know, we've all, we've all had that conversation a million times, but, you know, we're going to have to continue to educate. And in doing that, being able to give the analyst time to review the files and educate appro appropriately, you know, give them the time on the phone to make sure that the customer understands that their claim is important to us, um, just as every other claim is. And if you have 200 callbacks in a day, you're not going to be able to give five to 10 minutes to that person to explain, here's what you need to do, because you'll just fall further and further behind. But if you have better technology, you'll be able to manage that to give the analysts the ability to one, handle the claims, and two, be responsive to their customers. I mean, that's such a nugget. I mean, the, yeah. the fact that you can, uh, you're standardizing, making the process more efficient so that you can be more responsive and more communicative. So the quality of contact is better. And then, so you're managing those expectations, right? Like you alluded to earlier. And then people understand uh, what they need to do and what they can expect out of the process. So I'm curious, um, in that, 
Um, you talked about the producer or the agent. Um, does that also mean that when you have such a more efficient system, um, does the agent or producer have a different role or um, are they being communicated in the same fashion in terms of efficiency or uh, responsiveness as well? Um, do you see them playing a role in normalizing the expectations of their clients when you get into a default situation? I, I certainly think that it would. And understand what we're talking about isn't an existing case, but a, a best case, what we're striving to right. do. Because it, taking a step back, you know, we, we talked about the difference between insurance and surety for, for a few minutes. But the reality is that in that educational process, you know, we're in a situation where um, 90% of our claims are handled by our principles due to the indemnity obligation. Our, our principles are resolving those and understand the number 90 yep. is just pulled out of the air. I'm not, yep. um, you know, citing any study or going through any CNA or nationwide data saying that this is X or Y, but it, let's use 85%. If, it, if it's 85%, then 85% of those letters that you're sending out initially, only 15% of those you're going to get supporting documentation back, if not less. Um, maybe they get that they get that initial response from the surety and they say, you know what, I don't trust these insurance companies, even though we're sureties, leaving that aside. Um, right. well, we're just going to file suit. If they file suit, you're already taking a different tact. But you're only getting a, a subset of that information where they're providing that supporting documentation um, and seeking, a, for lack of a better term, adjustment or review by the claim analyst. And understand we're talking of generalizing about, you know, sort of a contract surety uh, payment bond claim, but we can extrapolate it to whatever type of claim we're talking about and modify it here and there. But, you know, in that situation, what we want to be able to do is effectively and efficiently get that 100% of claimants to the 15% of claimants that need that additional time, energy, and, and resource. And so when part of our job is to let the principals know as effectively and efficiently as possible, because if we're doing everything via mail, if we're doing everything, and prior to COVID, you know, that was a situation where a lot of times you did. So now your claimant is finding out about something. The notice was filed. You're hopeful that the mail got them the claim in time. You're giving them the information. You've now spent two and a half weeks or more in putting together a letter, getting that out, sending it via mail, waiting for a response, hopefully via mail, or a phone call where you get a, a claimant who says, I put that in the mail. Where have we been? And in those delays causes the frustration. And right. as a claimant, you're predisposed to being frustrated because think of how frustrated we all are when there's a delay in something that we feel should happen faster. Part of that is our educational obligation. And part of that is explaining what the process is. And in doing those things, you're hopeful that if we can better lay out the process and move that first part faster, we can give everyone better attention for that 15% because the agent isn't concerned and long circle return to your question. The agent isn't concerned about the 85% of the claims that came in. They're concerned about the 15% are problematic or the 1% where they have a relationship with the claimant filing the claim. So in those right. two circumstances, if we're able to get to that 1% with the claimant filing the claim faster, it puts them in a better position. And in the 85%, with the 15 that are of concern, they're able to voice specifically what the issue is, which we will then be able to more quickly respond to. Great. Well, so did, that, go ahead, Mark. Oh, I, so you kind of alluded to uh, pre-pandemic period and now kind of now that we're in the pandemic and one day, hopefully very much post-pandemic, things are changing. Um, so how would you characterize those changes? Well, I, it's a very difficult question uh, off the cuff, but I, I'd say that if anything, it's increasing the necessity of responsiveness. Um, because of the pandemic, you need to be able to respond more effectively and faster. In order to do that, you need email addresses. Um, as it relates to email addresses, think of how long bond forms have been in place and bond processes and application processes have been in place in nearly all of those for many years and understand that I'm generalizing. I don't have any specific right. knowledge of 
underwriting right. at CNA or at Nationwide. The great part about being a claims person is when deposed, I can always say that I've never written a bond and I haven't. So um, all that <laughs> said, if you're able to capture the email address when you first write that bond, when there's no expectation of loss, when there's no risk, if you're able to grab that piece of information and take those extra 10 seconds to key in an email address, you're going to be that much further ahead when you get a claim in because you can get that to your your principal almost immediately. You can get responses, right. you know, to claimants faster if you have their email address. Um, you know, the way that in the past, prior to the technology moving as it did, when we talk about email addresses now, is the same way that we would have talked about fax numbers fifteen right. years ago, eighteen years ago. Um, now the email, you know, the one of the early pushback that you had would be that not everyone has an email address. And that was true when, you know, you had uh, America Online was the place where you had an email address or whatever <laughs> your college, yeah. if you were lucky to go to school, had as your email address uh, name. But the lion's share of people didn't have them. Now they're so readily available and accessible. Um, and with the advent of technology, that not capturing that actually would be doing a disservice um, to everyone in the industry because someone else is going to be capturing it if you're not. And if you set an expectation of not getting email addresses, one, there'll be more frustration and delay on the back half of that. You know, I'm sure there's a push and pull about when it's best to do that or when you need to because the pushback obviously would be, why are we capturing 100% of email addresses when only X percent of items ever go into claim? And that number is de minimis. I mean, if it were, if it were a majority of, of files going into claim um, or suffering losses, then there wouldn't be a surety business. So we can set that aside and we can point to the fact that for the added three seconds across all of your bonds or the added 10 seconds to key in an email address, the time and energy savings on the back end of that uh, is worthwhile. I don't know what the right answer to that is, but it's just, these are all one person's thoughts on this as we talk about it. Right. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's great. I mean, you're being proactive with, uh, you know, contact information, data collection is going to save you on the back end. It's what you're saying. And that certainly seems more important as, um, you know, everybody, as you said, is expecting, uh, communications and contact very quickly. Um, so, and um, with the I can, pandemic, exactly. And with the pandemic, it made it more apparent that you needed it because now right. all of a sudden you had your people are remote, depending on how good of a system you had in place beforehand there. If, if we were doing it well, if we were planning for the future as we should have been, then your people shouldn't be uncomfortable being remote. It should be something they've done already. The duration of that remoteness, significant change. And leaving aside all of those issues, the fact that you're working from a laptop in your home or wherever you are, it, that shouldn't change. That shouldn't make you uncomfortable in handling the claims that you have so that you should be able to continue to provide the service level that you've, you and your people have grown accustomed to providing, um, even though that there's this new barrier as we're talking about the pandemic. But if you captured those email addresses, instead of spending a half an hour of your day calling claimants or calling principals to get email addresses or more, um, you're able yeah. to spend that time getting them the information. And please, Kat. Jim, I think it's interesting. You've talked about the data collection and how it, you know, that has sped up the process and made it more efficient, both in allocating work internally and in other ways. Are there other ways that you've been able to use that data to enhance the industry? Well, I don't know that I specifically can speak for the entire industry. Uh, right. I'm just <laughs> one, one person who doesn't have any uh, technical IT background. So as one person who um, thinks there's a lot of things that you can gain from it, we can talk about, you know, some hypotheticals where you'd see the data yeah. would help. You know, one of the things that we realized when we, um, when we designed our claim system we started shortly thereafter designing reports off that data because now we had all of this information and we we're building a baseline. And, you know, our claim system rolled out uh, April 1st, 2008, you know, so over, you know, 14 years, um, 
that claim system has been able to capture data. So you're able to see here's how many claims you receive, here's how many notices, and, and understand that one of the issues with data is terminology. You know, when, mm -hmm. when people say claim file or claim or notice, depending on how, the vernacular that you're using and the way that you're collecting that data, part of what you have to do is normalize. Because if you think of, you know, the surety and insurance industry, data isn't a problem. You know, you have hundreds of years of information. <laughs> Sureties, you have you have tens and 20 years of technical information. I, I mean, um, at CNA, our claim system for the financial side was developed in 1986. So you have... Tw you know, 24 years when you hit the year two Y2K concerns, you had 24 years of data. So it's not the data that you have, it's how can you effectively utilize that data? And one of the things we saw in claims was that you needed to be able to use that information to, to help guide you in making decisions, staffing, um, claim workloads, um, processes, what, what, types of bonds don't really have recovery, you know, where are you allocating your human capital um, to best recover on files, things like that. But after you capture those years of data, it's, it's how do you use that to make better decisions? And, you know, obviously, you know, what we're talking about isn't a tutorial in um, discussing like predictive or prescriptive analytics. You know, what we're talking about is as non IT people, how can we use this information to maybe confirm things that we think may be the case or disprove things that have been the old adage or the old wisdom, like, um, you know, claims, claim, claim cycles are 10 years, or um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones, but there was always that get, it, it surety claims work like a, uh, an ocean with the wave and it crests at this point and then it, the claims fall and, and, maybe we don't need to crest and maybe we don't need to fall and, and we can be instead of an ocean with giant waves, we could be a pond with uh, rocks hitting on occasion where there are smaller ripples, but we can maybe moderate that better. You know, one of the things that I, I always thought about was, you, you know, um, if you look at claim loss activity, which you hadn't prior been capturing, if you looked at something like that and you compare it with credit scores and you could see if there were correlations between credit score and loss activity, you know, could it be causal? Could it not be, you know, could there be a, a disproportionate impact? And one of the things that I always thought was um, just an example, say you look at a, a product type that you write and using your credit risk modeling, if the bottom 15% of the credit scores are responsible for a majority of the claim activity, 70, 80, 90% of the loss activity that you're experiencing in that product type, it would seem over an extended period of time looking at that data, maybe there's something that causes that to be the case, but it would allow you to at least dig in further to say, well, if we don't write this bottom 15%, obviously it would seem that our loss activity would be better and the overall product that we're providing would be better because we're suffering fewer losses, we're writing better accounts, we'd be able to essentially avoid those problems and gain the benefit of that information that you've already had in order to make future decisions a little smoother. That would be one. Right, and that, that's uh, fascinating. Well, because yeah, I, I mean, so you please Mark. You, well, you're talking about that. Um, not only uh, analyzing this data is uh, improving your claims capabilities. You're in fact, improving the surety company overall, by providing that information to the underwriting side as well, so that decision making is is uh, really improved across the uh, the operation. Well, is that, that you think that's, that's a goal. true statement? Uh, I, I would hope so. Uh, th you know, that's the goal yep. of all of us because uh, you know, uh, ten minutes ago in our conversation or so, I guess I shouldn't put times on it because I'm not exactly sure. But a little while ago in our conversation, <laughs> we had said, you know, we. We, we had that conversation of our business at its core is dollars in and dollars out. And if we can allow a dollars in decision that negatively impacts you in the short term to improve a dollars out decision, and the net of that is positive, then it's positive for the organization overall. It, it, it's harder in the front end because as a business, you have to say, you know what, we don't want this. And we were using 85%. We don't want this 15% of business that we can readily get. And, and it's going to be hard because you want to 
you want to find that balance um, and being able to say, here's why we're thinking of this. You know, it might be hard from a business to say, let's leave that on the table. Let, let, we understand it's there, but maybe we don't want that business. That's not ours. Let, let's, let's let the market determine those. And obviously, you, even if you made a decision like that, you could be subject to, you know, um, getting state approval to change rate to reduce those people who are paying. You know, any one of those variables could change it too. Um, and there's a million things and you could get caught up in that too. But at the end of the day, what we're just trying to do is take the information that we're gleaning now that we've been able to get it. You know, we're, this is a, a job where you stopped looking at a spreadsheet and now we're using actuaries and we're using uh, analytics people and we're using people who can, who can not just build these formulas, um, but extrapolate the data and understand that how we can best utilize it to, to make our decisions um, more effective, you know, and then in, in thinking about, uh, I would think that would be the best example, the one that I just gave, um, and where do you say to yourself, we're going to leave that on the table, and in leaving that on the table, it's still a better business decision for you. We can better al allocate capital somewhere else, writing these types of bonds or moving into these types of markets. You know, if, if you think about it with however many bond forms we have, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of bond forms, if you look at it across the board, you'd be able to see some things. And some might be, this is the way that it works. And But to say that, you know, claims are, are random occurrences or average, there are things that lead you into it. It doesn't, you know, it's not blind luck. And if we can look at why some of the things happen the way that they do, maybe it would allow us to then say, you know, maybe we'll beg off some things, or maybe there's a better opportunity for us to write something here. Maybe you have a, a bond type that isn't necessarily profitable, but over years and years, the claim activity that you see is, is de minimis, and the recovery portions of that are Herculean relative to the other um, types of bonds that you're seeking to collect on. So, so Jim, I, I know you said you're not a tech person, you're a <laughs> lawyer, but I'm, I'm going to ask you, so where do you see this going? Um, with all this data, do you see uh, surety companies more and more using artificial intelligence to analyze it even further for trend analysis and what they should be doing? Mark, as you pull me further and further away from things I actually know about, um, <laughs> I need to be into, uh, a game of hypotheticals. Um, I don't. I don't know. I think at the end of the day, regardless of all the additions you make technologically, ours is still a people business. They, they claimants and principals need to pick up the phone, be able to call someone and talk to them, and that someone has to be able to explain to them what it is. They can look at a spreadsheet and say, in the aggregate, this is what it looks like. But they need to understand the nuance of, one, this is the product that we wrote. The agent is, is explaining that at the point of sale. But two years later on a construction project, when it starts to get messy, they need to be able to know that they can reach out to not just their agent, but their claim department. And that claim department has value. You know, We're not just sending angry letters. We're not just saying, what's the status of this? We're here to help. We're here to add value, it, whether that be in the front end with here are the bond forms that we're getting, here are some of the language that we're troubled by. Let's talk about that and how you would envision that on the claim side. You know, there's a lot of value that a claim department adds um, that you don't necessarily see in the dollars and cents. Well, I love to hear um, uh, your characterization that technology can improve, make more efficient but it doesn't do away with the importance of relationship. And whether you're on the underwriting side or on the claim side, relationship is paramount. And I know that's something that producers uh, feel is very important. It's, it's great to hear from you as well. Well, and Mark, well, and hearing think... you say that embracing, sorry, sorry, Jim, well, please, yeah. hearing you say that embracing that change really uh, in technology allows you to have the time to spend the time on people um, and not be caught up in other tasks. That's, I think that's really key here. Well, absolutely. And, and Mark, just returning to your point for one second, when you said underwriting and claims, the reality is that for all of our principles, it's the same thing. We're, we're all nationwide. So to the extent that you have a question related to underwriting or you have a question related to claims, you call your agent, you call your, you call your underwriter, you call, if you call the underwriter with a question like that, the underwriter comes to claims. 
And because our job is about making sure that you get the information that you need to help you make good decisions. We obviously can't provide legal advice. We can't walk you down that path. What we can do is add the value of what we've done. For a principal, this is the first claim you've seen. I don't know what I do next. Do I, do I run to a lawyer? Do I, this, this person says I'm owed money. This person says I'm not owed money. I have a paid one paid, pay if paid. Is it valid in this state? Those types of questions are all things that come to the, come to the agent's mind first. And they say, well, you know, he hasn't paid one paid, you're good. Well, depending on the state, you may not be. And, and that's where when you reach out to the underwriter or you reach out to the, to the, and they'll reach out to the claim department and we can say, here are some things you should be concerned with. Here's, here's some risks, here are some issues. You know, what we're trying to do is, is help you to do what you do effectively because we don't wanna be in the middle. You know, our bond at the end of the day is a contract of secondary liability. We want you to be successful. We want you to close out projects. We want you to pay every labor and material man fairly for what the labor and material they provide and the materials that are incorporated in the project. We wanna make sure that the obligees are getting what it is that they've contracted for. That's our goal. That's our responsibility if and when our principal is ultimately unsuccessful in providing that. We don't want you to be unsuccessful. We want you to be as successful as possible. We want you to grow. We want you to improve. And we want to be able to help along the way because you'll remember, even if you have a claim scenario that turns out well, you'll remember that Nationwide was with you, that we're here, and that we added value. And when someone says, you know, this, we can we can save a... 10 cents per thousand, or we could save a nickel. And I understand as I'm not an underwriter, I don't know those numbers. So you can have an underwriter come in and correct those in a, in a subsequent podcast if you'd like. But whatever that is, they'll know that there's additional value in being able to pick up the phone and know that there's someone there to help. And that's the service that we're trying to provide. And I think we do a very good job at it. Yeah. Well, and it's it's just great to hear that even when we're talking about uh, numbers and technology, it all comes back to people and working better with people in our industry. Uh, thanks for being on with us today, James. It's been great chatting with you about claims. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll be able pleasure. to have... Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll be able someday to... I'll learn not to, not to talk over you, but that's... <laughs> <won't be today. laughs> that's okay. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to have you back sometime. We can try it again. <laughs> Yeah. But it's been great chatting with you. Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure being on. You've been listening to Let's Get Surety, brought to you by the National Association of Surety Bond Producers. For more information about the NASBP and its members, visit nasbp.org. Before we go, we just want to thank Allianz Trade again for their generous support in sponsoring this episode of Let's Get Surety. Allianz Trade is the trademark used to designate a range of services provided by Euler Hermes. Euler Hermes is the global leader in trade credit insurance and recognized specialist in the areas of surety, collections, structured trade credit, and political risk. For more information on Allianz Trade Surety, visit their web- website referenced in the description.